is one that we've asked uh, the Democratic presidential candidates, and that is, what do you think is the most important problem facing the United States in the next decade? And uh, what ideas do you have for dealing with it? Well, I think the problem remains, and it's, it's a, a group of problems that, uh, and that is uh, maintaining and continuing uh, this expansion of our economy uh, so that we can provide jobs with a future and opportunity for all of our people. Uh, I think it is the, the problem of uh, achieving a, uh, a lasting peace with the reduction particularly of nuclear weapons in the world and to uh, reduce and hopefully one day eliminate that uh, threat that hangs over us. I think others to uh, help as we can those nations that are trying to establish democracies and uh, become working members of the family of nations. And I believe uh, the restoration of some traditional values of family and neighborhood, and the uh, distortion that's occurred down through the last few decades of the relationship within our own country of our different uh, levels of government and to restore authority and autonomy uh, to those levels uh, where the federal government has assumed too much of it. I'll probably think of several more answers to that later, but <laughs> right okay. now I think that covers basically the economy, the economic <clears throat> expansion that is needed and that we have embarked on the, and peace in the world and reduction of the tensions in the armaments. Uh, sir, on the deficit question, I noticed yesterday you, you joked slightly about it and then emphasized how seriously you take the deficit problem. Uh, could you be more specific? How serious a problem is it and what would you do to uh, deal with it? Well, that would be a part of the overall generic answer that I gave about uh, the economy. Yes, the deficit is a problem. Uh, no one can ignore it but it's been going on for some 50 years. And for most of that time, almost totally in that time, it has been a deliberate part of government policy. And some of us who complained about it back through the years always said that it would get literally out of control, that you could not go on that way without coming to a day of reckoning. And we now at that day of reckoning. I think the basic part of that deficit is due to uh, government itself and the excessive share of the people's earnings, the gross national product that the government is taking. And so uh, we're going to continue. We've made a proposal for a down payment over the next three years that is pretty evenly divided between uh, some revenues, uh, not by raising rates, but by uh, eliminating some tax practices that uh, we think uh, aren't fairly distributed. And that, of course, is part of this temporary down payment. But at the same time, I have uh, ordered the Treasury Department to embark on a study of the entire tax structure as to how we can collect the uncollected tax that is being evaded by people who owe it and don't pay, simplify the tax structure, broaden the base, hopefully reduce the rates on individuals. You, excuse me. Uh, you had mentioned last week in passing that, uh, that you saw the need at some point to restructure Social Security for new workers coming into the program. Could you Well, I think we have to, we've got to look at the whole governmental structure, and this includes the entitlement programs. There have been demographic changes that have been ignored that make uh, uh, some policies uh, now leading inevitably uh, toward another day of reckoning if we don't uh, reorder 
those programs, about half of your deficit has been structural. About half of your deficit has been cyclical, a result of the mm -hmm. recessions. And we are eliminating that half, the cyclical, uh, by the recovery that has taken place. And evidence of that is that just between August and the first of the year, our own projections of the deficit were reduced by $15 billion because we obtained that much more tax revenue uh, than we had anticipated uh, due to the, to the recovery in the economy. Mr. President, on the entitlements, can you be more specific about uh, this restructuring? It is uh, a year in which you're asking voters to return you to office. Can't you be more specific about what you would do for Medicare and Social Security? No, not really, because this is something that is, uh, is going to require a thorough study to ensure that you do not pull the rug out from under anyone who is presently de dependent on those programs. Uh, they must not be frightened as they have been by political demagoguery as they were in the 82 campaign when our opponents took advantage of the fact that Social Security, the program, was facing, and by our date, as of July 1983, facing uh, outright bankruptcy. And they denied this. And then they waged a political campaign that we were out in some way, uh, we intended to take the payments uh, either reduce them or take them away from people dependent on them. And they cause panic among people who are in a, uh, the senior citizens, they're not in a position to, uh, to defend themselves against this when someone says, uh, oh, did you know that they're going to do this or this or that to you? But you could be more specific uh, well, and put some of these fears to rest, couldn't you? Well, I had tried to, uh, and everyone seemed to ignore it, I had said over and over again in talking about Social Security's problem that nothing must be done to penalize those people who are now dependent on those checks. But what we need to do is a revamping of the program. We finally then, when the election was over and the demagoguery stopped, yeah. uh, then our opponents agreed to a bipartisan get together to find an answer to the immediate problem. But isn't it risky now in an election year for you to say that we should revamp and restructure these programs without being specific? No, as long as they understand and as long as you will print that what I said, that there is no intention on the part of anyone of taking away from those people now getting, and maybe also it would be well if you printed that the rebuttal to the demagoguery of the 82 campaign is the fact that today the average couple, married couple on Social Security, is getting $180 a month more than they were getting before we came here. So uh, these are our goals and our purposes. But I, there is no way to answer until you have gone into a study of the whole actuarial situation. Now, I read in one of the interviews with one of the present candidates of the other party um, where he was uh, claiming that, that's, well, there's no problem with Social Security at all uh, because it's safe till uh, the end of the century. Mm. Well, 1984 isn't too far away from the end of the century. Yeah. Well. How can he so carelessly dismiss the fact that those same people out there who, as you've said, can be frightened, can be frightened if someone is saying to them, uh, yes, the program's going to run into another financial bind, uh, but he doesn't offer any suggestion for solving it. I'm saying that what we must do now is more of what we did in that temporary fix. Right is a bipartisan facing up to the fact that you ensure that those people are going to get their payments. But let me take one more pass at this. Do you think then in, in a second term, should you win re-election, that uh, 
you will want to take another look at the structural problems in Social Security as well as Medicare. As long as it is in the context that we are not going to pull the rug out from anyone who is presently dependent on those programs. Okay. May I ask you a question about the, uh, what you mentioned a moment ago about broadening the tax base as being an objective in your uh, tax simplification study. Would you accept a tax simplification that does lead to, an, in effect, an increased tax burden on Americans? Or would your goal be to keep the tax burden the same as it is now? I am looking for a program that can bring about simplification, but I see no need to increase uh, the burden on individuals. Uh, this is what we set out to reduce that. Right. And simplification, uh, what we're looking toward, and I can't answer now because this is a study that has to be made and it's a very complex subject. When you say broaden the tax base, again, you're talking about involving in the payment of taxes people now who for one reason or the other have been able to, in many instances, um, remain totally tax-free or remain well below uh, what they should be paying and thus uh, it limits your ability to reduce the overall burden on individuals by tax rate cuts because uh, of the lost revenue, which uh, right now is estimated around $100 billion a year. Is that what you basically after the lost revenue? Or would you, in effect, net more with a simplification program? That's well, when you look at a simplification program, you are also looking at a way of making it impossible for those who are presently evading to evade. When you say evading, you don't mean evading illegally. You mean from unfair tax breaks oh, no. as well, right? Oh, no. An awful lot of outright evading. But in addition uh, to that, you're also talking about uh, loopholes, tax breaks, whatever you want to call it. I don't, I hesitate, I won't, I won't answer that now as to all, what all will be in the study. We are as I've said before in our present proposal, we are changing some that we believe, uh, uh, while they were undoubtedly well-intentioned, uh, they have led to some uh, taking an, getting an advantage that is denied to others. Uh, where that is true, then that should be corrected, uh, whether, you're, whether you have a deficit or right. uh, have a tax reform or not. Uh, on the subject of defense spending, sir, uh, you've accepted a reduction this time around in the budget uh, fight in the rate of defense growth. Uh, we wanted to know whether that's a, a real reduction or are you just uh, stretching it out? In other words, you'd have the same buildup at the same cost over a longer period of time. Well, obviously to have such a um to be able to make such a reduction as we did involves some elements of stretching it out, uh, which means that over a longer period of time, uh, uh, the same amount of money is distributed uh, so that you have people taking a longer time with their taxes to pay for it. But the, the defense budget is not determined by how much you want to spend. It's determined by what is necessary to guarantee our security and thus the ability to preserve the peace. And for those uh, who approach the budget from the standpoint of, well, let's make it this percentage of uh, the budget or let's, uh, uh, let's cut this amount of money, how do you how do you have national security on that basis? Everything that you're going to cut from the defense budget, you have to say, does this reduce to an unacceptable point our ability to preserve our security or not? And if it does, then you can't make that cut. If you can delay, if you can postpone uh, some things, and you look and say, well, 
in looking at the potential adversaries in the world, what emergencies might arise, this is not an, uh, an unacceptable risk. Uh, we, we can do this, particularly when it is to help bring about the economic strengthening. Now, we have been doing this, and uh, we have, we ourselves, with all of the talk about defense spending as being the source of added funds for reducing the deficit, and I've seen the terms used uh, many times in the media, that uh, record defense spending. Mm -hmm. It's record if you take the number of dollars without regard to the value of those dollars. It is far below any record at all. There is no hint of such a thing if you take it as a percentage of the budget or as a percentage of gross national product. And in either one of those ratings, our defense spending is far below what was customary back through the years. In the Kennedy era, 1962, I believe it was, the defense budget was about 47.8% of the total budget. It's down around 27% uh, or so now of the, of the budget. It is a smaller percentage of the gross national product than it was then. So we think that we are, uh, we are really tightening our belt to make this reduction that we're proposing. Now, how do you arrive at lower defense spending ever? You arrive at it by the other thing that we're trying to bring about, and that is a reduction in armaments with those who could be considered possible adversaries. Then, if you have a reduction of the threat, you can have a reduction of the deterrent and the deter and on our side. And that is a road toward lesser defense spending. Well, we'd like to move on to that subject, but before I ask you about that, let me just ask once more if it's correct to assume that you see this um, reduction in the rate of growth that has been accepted now as primarily a postponement of the buildup, a deferral of the buildup? Or do you see it as causing any elimination of anything that you had in mind? Not in the sense of, of weapon systems or uh, right. reducing manpower. There are, let me be, let me be honest, say, this whole thing is definitely not all postponement. We have been working and, as a matter of fact, had made $16 billion cut in the defense budget ourselves before we even then took this further step. But much of that was based on the things that we ourselves have been discovering, as we have in every other area of government, of government practices that could be changed. Uh, some of that, that uh, spending cut reflects uh, the findings of the Grace Commission that we're now implementing. Uh, all of this thing that you all have had such a field day with with regard to wrenches costing thousands of dollars and bolts costing four dollars and a half when they should cost four cents and so forth. No one has published. Those are our figures. We found that that was going on. And we are the ones who have changed that and already the savings are in hundreds of millions of dollars of rebates that have come back to us. To say nothing of the future savings now of correcting that practice and there have been indictments, hundreds of them, for fraud and uh, things of that kind. Incidentally, how much of a shock was that for you? To what? How much of a shock was that for you to discover the amount of uh, conniving that defense contractors might attempt? Well, it had to be quite a shock. Uh, when you first uh, came up with uh, a finding of some little gizmo that uh, you could buy in a store off the shelf for <laughs> about a tenth or less of, of what we were paying for it, don't you wish you could have had some of those on when you were campaigning? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. May I ask you about uh, east-west tensions, uh, which you raised or mentioned a moment ago. Are there no further steps that the United States can take unilaterally now to uh, reduce tensions with the Soviet Union or to persuade them to return to the negotiating table. For instance, 
submitting the uh, threshold test ban treaty for ratification, which I think is on their list. We are, we are in uh, conversations with the Soviet Union on a number of things of this kind, and on uh, uh, things like uh, uh, we'll soon be uh, talking about a chemical warfare uh, treaty. Um, and uh, with regard to their position, I think, I think the tensions are, uh, frankly, more evident in rhetoric than they are in actuality. I think that there is less tension today and less threat and danger with the rebuilding that we have done that makes us uh, more secure than there was earlier when our defenses were so lax uh, that there was a window of vulnerability. Um, no, we, and they have agreed now uh, to come back in the negotiations on one of the three uh, treaties that they walked out on, the, the, uh, the Conventional Weapons Treaty, the Multiple Balanced Force MBFR Treaty. Um, we're hopeful that they will come back in the others. We have, uh, we've made it plain that uh, we're flexible, that while we have made a proposal, uh, uh, we have evidenced uh, our willingness to negotiate and what uh, may be uh, differing views of theirs. An example of that in the intermediate range of weapons in Europe. Uh, my first proposal was, and I think it was a common sense proposal, and that was zero on both sides. Eliminate them all, that type of weapon. Well, the Soviets uh, would not hear of that. We said, all right, then, granted that would be our goal, and we think it's a good goal, but we're willing then to talk whatever reduction in numbers that we can make that will be verifiable, that will be fair and even for both sides. And uh, that still remains on the table. And, uh, but, but the administration seems to have taken the position now that no new revisions or new rev revised proposals will be offered until they come to the negotiating table. And then uh, you might have something. Is that a correct? No, what we're saying is we're not going to sit here and negotiate with ourselves and uh, uh, while they sit out there not participating, right. uh, waiting to see what we'll finally come up with, that would be very poor negotiating strategy. We have said to them, we're flexible, we're <coughs> willing to negotiate fair and verifiable agreements when they're ready to come back to the table. Do you think that by not negotiating or not going back to the table, the Russians might be trying to influence the outcome of the American election? Oh. Uh, I don't, I don't think someone could rule that out. I'm not going to make the charge, but uh, I'm not going to also guess at what might be there. Part of their problems might simply be uh, with the change now in leadership uh, that they're in a period of uh, putting their shop together. I have, on an informal level, do you have a better reading of the new leader there, or have you been in touch with him in some way, in some oblique way? Uh? Well, the, the vice president uh, had an opportunity to meet with him uh, when he was there. Uh, and as I say, there is, there is communication between our two governments. And uh, we remain optimistic that um, we can uh, arrive at agreements. In the first place, we want them, and they need them. Frank, do you want to ask about the Middle East? The Middle East. Uh, in the last year, it, it would seem that uh, the, the government, the United States government, might have um, misjudged the stability of, of Lebanon and the Lebanese government and the, the effectiveness of its army and the willingness of Syria to cooperate with some of our stratagems. Uh, are you satisfied with the, the basic information you've gotten on what had, uh, that was the underpinning for your strategy there? Are you? Were you misinformed in the first place? No, we knew that what we were attempting to help with was a very complex and complicated problem. And uh, what we and our allies joined together to do 
was based on the necessity for a withdrawal of the foreign forces that were in there. Remember that when this all started, um, Israel, because of the violations of its own northern border by the Palestinians, the PLO, had gone all the way to Beirut. War was being fought in the city streets there with the PLO. Uh, the casualties among civilians were probably exceeding those of the military. Uh, the Syrians, uh, uh, they were also on Lebanese soil. And we went in to help bring about the removal of the PLO, who felt that any uh, effort to surrender would, could result in a massacre. And uh, they were, some 10 to 15,000 were removed from the country. Uh, Syria had indicated uh, that it too would leave, uh, the Israelis would leave. And then Syria changed its mind. That was unanticipated. But even so, the purpose of the troops of Italy, the United Kingdom, France, and ourselves were there to more or less help maintain order while a government, a viable government of Lebanon was created, and then to help train, at which we did, that their army to then go out and occupy the areas occupied by foreign forces, Syria and Israel, as they withdrew, because also in those areas were the militias, the unofficial armies that had been fighting each other and fighting the government uh, such as it was in Lebanon. Now, for quite some time, progress was made, and I still have to say, uh, right now, the progress, the meetings that, uh, uh, that have taken place in, in Switzerland uh, would not have taken place had all of us not done what we did. It is true that when Syria balked and began supporting some of the rebel elements, but our whole idea was that for Libya or for Lebanon to have a government, they were going to have to make peace with those militias and find some kind of a broad-based government. And they've set out and they've tried to do that. Um, it didn't succeed. It's, but well, the very fact that all of us began to be subject to terrorist attacks and uh, changed the basing of our troops, us putting them on ships offshore and so forth, actually was evidence of the fact that we were succeeding. And those who didn't want success knew that one of the steps in having their way was uh, to force the withdrawal of, these, of our own forces. Was the level of success, as you describe it, uh, worth the price that we paid, the uh, dead Marines? I don't know how you answer this thing that is becoming worldwide now, the terrorist method of the suicide attacks and so forth. Uh, I'd like to say that there is no cause that's worth the life of any man, but we know that isn't true. Uh, We did not succeed in what we thought uh, could have gone forward. Uh, there has not been, they're still working at it there, the Lebanese government. Uh, one thing also, we did a good job of training their military and equipping it. What we couldn't anticipate then was uh, at the instigation of Syria, uh, on ethnic and religious bases, uh, some of the elements of that trained army uh, then refused to perform against uh, the radical forces that the army had been trained, trained to handle. If, uh, but that doesn't change the need for us to continue in the Middle East overall with what must take place and we hope if we can be helpful that we can bring about and that is a meeting of the moderate Arab states and Israel, and the bringing about of peace, just as Egypt and Israel brought about peace. If, if the circumstances were the same, but hypothetically we were back four years and you were running against President Carter, wouldn't you be uh, hammering him for the death of the Marines in, in Beirut? For what? For the death of the Marines in, in the Beirut massacre. No, if I had all the knowledge that I presently have, 
about the situation. There was one thing, whether it was campaigning or just making speeches in, uh, in the past that I have always recognized. And that is that there are a number of areas in which only a president has the information, all the information on a situation. And those who criticize are criticizing without having access to that same information. Um, well, how about two more? Oh. Uh, would you, uh, a quick one, would you veto the bill uh, requiring the United States Embassy to be moved from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem? I am hoping I won't have to, but like the several previous presidents before me, I think that that is a most unwise thing the place of Jerusalem, the West Bank, things of this kind. These are all the matters that must be negotiated between these forces. And the United States has no right to put itself in a position of trying to lean one way or the other on, on those areas for negotiation. Uh, why don't, I'd like to ask a final question uh, about Central America. Uh, Mr. President, um, I wonder if I could ask you to uh, explain or, or uh, justify or how the United States can go about assisting people who are, as you have called them, freedom fighters, who are seeking to overthrow a government that we have diplomatic relations with. and answer, if you could, critics who are worried that this is increasing our involvement, involvement in Central America? Well, the answer to that is, first of all, this particular government of Nicaragua is a government that was set up by force of arms. Uh, the people have never chosen it. It's a revolutionary government. And that government, in violation of its pledge to us at a time when it was uh, a revolutionary force trying to become a government, mm -hmm. had promised that it would not aid the uh, guerrillas in El Salvador who are attempting to overthrow a duly elected government and a democratic government. And they have violated that. The guerrillas are literally being directed from bases near Managua. They're being supplied uh, by that government. And the other factor with regard to why I have referred to them on occasion as freedom fighters is because many of them are elements of the same revolution that put the Sandinista government in force. The revolution against the Somoza dictatorship and our government, under the previous administration, sat back and never lifted a finger in behalf of Somoza. And then when the fighting was over, did start to give financial aid to the revolutionary government to help it install itself. And had to cancel that when it discovered what that government was doing. During the revolution against Somoza, the revolutionaries appealed to the Organization of American States of which we're a member also, and appealed to that organization to ask Somoza to step down and end the bloodshed. And the Organization of American States asked for a statement of what were the goals of the revolution, and they were provided. Democracy, a pluralistic government, free elections, free labor unions, freedom of the press, human rights observed. Those were the goals of the revolution submitted in writing to the Organization of American States. After they got in, they followed the pattern that was followed by Castro in Cuba. Those other elements that were not Sandinista, other groups who wanted, and they thought all the same thing, democracy, to rid themselves of a dictatorship, those elements were denied participation in the government Arrests were made, there were some who were exiled, there were some, I'm afraid, were executed. And 
many of the people now fighting as so-called Contras are elements of the revolution. And it is less an overthrow that they're fighting for as it is a demand that they be allowed to participate in the government and that the government keep its promises as to what it had intended for the people. And I see, uh, I see no uh, dichotomy in our supporting uh, the government, the democratic government of El Salvador and the Contras here. And we've made it plain to Nicaragua made it very plain that uh, this will stop when they uh, keep their promise and restore uh, uh, a democratic rule and have elections. Now, they've finally been pressured. The pressures led to them saying they'll have an election. I think they've scheduled it for next November. But there isn't anything yet to indicate that that election will be anything but the kind of rubber stamp that we see uh, in any totalitarian government. Uh, how do you have, uh, there aren't any rival candidates, there aren't any rival parties, and how would they campaign without a free press? Well, that's a good note for us to close on. In a free press. <laughs> Thank you very much.